Uh, last week or Thursday, we thought that the uh, homogeneous isotropic universe, which Alex also discussed a little bit today, uh, and uh, this week we do the perturbed uh, universe, uh, mainly where the metric is not f or w, at large scales quite close to f or w, on small scales will be significantly perturbed. The metric perturbation is still not that large, except in black holes, I think, of that, but uh, density perturbations can become very large. When we form dark matter halos, we'll see like it's a density contrast of about 200 in the centers of gal outside black holes, you can get to thousands or ten thousands, and so on. Linear regime, what we'll be meaning by linear regime, just so that for definition, is delta rho, the change, the average changes in rho, or the changes in density, over the average density is less than 1. Okay. That's so that you can do rho, rho squared, and so on, and this series makes sense. Okay, because rho squared will be smaller than rho, as opposed to when it's uh, uh, greater than 1, delta, delta over rho, uh, it's greater than 1, this thing uh, increases with power. Rho to the 10, uh, rho uh, squared of 10 is bigger than rho, 10 and 100, as opposed to 1 and 24. Okay, so here are a few references. Today we'll speak a bit, uh, very descriptively and simply, about the cosmic microwave background, which is in principle fairly basic physics, but in practice, to do it properly, to, to get constraints on the cosmic microwave background from observations is really very difficult task. And we shall try to sketch the basics of some of the basics, not even all. Um, uh, uh, and if you want to know more, you either go again to uh, you know, the kinetic theory of the kinetics of the photon and baryon fluid coupled to gravity. Uh, and it's uh, uh, only if you're really into it, you know. Or you can also play with the codes. Nowadays, they are deceptively simple to use, but they're very complicated. They're ten, of the order of 10,000 lines of them, like that, or, or, or C, or the older ones in Fortran. Uh, so they're not very, uh, or C++ or things like that, but uh, like, uh, like uh, uh, what's it called? Uh, the class school. Uh, okay, so, but uh, at different levels, Wayne Yu has very old pages from the late 90s or early 2000s where he, uh, where he was the one who predicted uh, all what you'd see in the cosmic microwave background. There were a few people, uh, Wayne Yu, there was, uh, and his group with Joe Silk and uh, Sugiyama and uh, and there was uh, contributions by people like uh, Mark and Nikoski and Bobbins and things like that. Anyway, I hope I'm not forgetting the major person. Uh, yes, I am. The people who did CMB fast, Zaldariaga and so um, Anyway, so this developed in uh, the early 2000s, basically, when you started getting also precise observations. Uh, the first fluctuations in the CMB, which I'll describe, were were like the year 1992, exactly when I started my master. Uh, the, the, and this, this was a revolution. The, the, the precise fluctuations to a large degree were WMAP 2002, and then in the 2013, 14, 15, and so on, there were the Planck results, which are the most precise you'll get with really. Uh, as far as the temperature fluctuations go, you could get other things, like polarization. Anyway, so uh, there's a short, nice review here, old but very nice, by Silk, Sumiyama, and you. And, uh, and uh, also an intermediate level review by you and Donaldson of the Cosmic Microwave. These other books are mainly for large scale structure and galaxy formation, which I'll talk about the three remaining days of my talks, tomorrow and the other two days. Okay, so this will be uh, for uh, structural formation, mainly from Newtonian point of view. I think Alexei will touch on perturbation theory from the relativistic. But I'll explain like I did with the 
with the, with the background evolution some of the relations between the two. You will really, for practical purposes of galaxies and large scale structure up to gigaparsecs, up to five gigaparsecs or even scale, again, you mainly need the Newtonian. For the CFB, you need relativistic, if only for the reason that it deals with photons, and these are intrinsically relativistic. So the CMB is further complicated not only by the kinetics and Boltzmann equation and so on, but, but you need to take care of your of your gauge variables and time slicing and, and, and stuff that Alexei maybe will talk about more in the next talk. Uh, okay, uh, so this has both relativistic and uh, uh, and Newtonian this has mainly relativistic you're about to do that, but you should know general relativity if you're done, because perturbation theory of general relativity is not that simple. So it's not hideously complicated, but you need to know the basics. You know. Uh, and then galaxy cooperation from all sorts of perspective is by a huge, I mean, quite extensive book by Noel, Hunter Bosch, and Simon White. And it contains cosmology, background cosmology, relativistic, non relativistic, galaxies, and that function, how galaxies form almost everything that you can imagine. Not in very big detail, of course, but yeah, almost everything connected to the talks today, except the CMB. That's not here. This has everything except the CMB. What is the CMB? It's uh, that thing. <laughs> you see this. Uh, Temperature, the uh, background radiation, which will, uh, is uh, a black body, we'll, we'll try to define it a bit more precisely, with little temperature fluctuations, differences in temperature from one place to another in the sky. This is, of course, artificially color coded, okay? Uh, the first thing you see is there are some similarities between this temperature fluctuations and this density fluctuations in the galaxy. You may want to imagine that there is a connection. I'll try to show that there is. There are some similarities, on, and there are some differences also that are important that I'll speak about. But, 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 but there are similarities in the statistics, and you can do that in very big detail. And then, so you imagine that uh, the universe was very hot. And uh, uh, when it was very hot and got ionized, we're going back in time. Let's say we go back in time. And the galaxies collide and so on. When you compress things, they get hot. You know, and you expand them, they get cold. Like, uh, you know, your, your gas fluid that goes with smoke, it, it comes out of a lighter canister, becomes colder. Also, in the uh, uh, the gas in the refrigerator, if you're own, and they expand it, it gets cold and so on. It's, so it's general. So if you go back, generally you get hot because we are compressing things. They're, they're moving at faster speed uh, if they're uh, particles, if they're like particles other than photons. If they're photons, they're blue shifted. Okay, this is important. So normal particles, normal relativistic, when you compress them, they heat up by. Uh, by increasing the speed, kinetic energy and v square increases. Relativistic particles like photons, they heat up by being blue shifted. They get colder by being red shifted. Okay? Because they have a constant C. They cannot change their speed. So what they change is their frequency. It's important. Okay, so you go back, you are ionized, meaning you're a plasma, not a, a, a gas anymore. And you go further back. Uh, nuclei can disintegrate and so on and I used to give a little bit of a talk uh, about this period I'm not going to give it uh, this time uh, the, the pre-CMB but I actually talked about it a little bit so you get the very important helium production by the way uh, a, a very uh, uh, short side story the guy who called the Big Bang Big Bang was Fred Hoyle who um, who uh, was making a joke. He didn't like the idea. He wanted a steady state of the universe. And, but he wrote the definite paper, or more or less definite paper, with my uh, late supervisor, Roger Taylor, Harlan Taylor, 
we showed that helium can be definitely produced in the Big Bang in the observed quantity. The helium is really too large, even in very old stars, which you cannot say that they had, uh, there's no time for them to have re received the helium from other stars and so on. So if you start with hydrogen, stars cannot make enough helium, and they showed that, and the helium would be in the Big Bang. Uh, when I asked Roger about this, he said Fred Hoyle liked to uh, discover his own. <laughs> he liked to check it out, even if, so if the Big Bang is correct, you would be the one, not somebody else to prove him wrong. Okay. But he remained believing in the steady state even after that. Right? That's another story. Okay, so this is the picture that I showed you on the first day that you can find in Wikipedia and things like that. Okay, uh, you can find it by Google Cosmic History. Most, uh, most important thing, this is only a few years old, this picture, is 500, not most important, one of the most important things. It tells you the first star started forming 400 million years after the beginning of the expansion. Well, we're seeing now really big galaxies, uh, we think, we are seeing really big galaxies 200 million years. So the picture is being revised even from five years ago. Yeah, it tells you 400 million years for a star, we really now think it's much earlier than the first star. Now we'll talk about that uh, maybe on Wednesday if uh, God is uh, waiting. So how does all this go about? How do we do to have perturbation? The most important thing about gravity is a clustering instability. Meaning that if I compress uh, normal gas, it will do sound waves. I talk, the gas next to my uh, mouth is compressed, and then decompressed, and compressed, and decompressed, and so on. And somebody, you guys, or somebody else can hear it at a certain distance away, okay? And gravity, when you compress things, they start to be self-gravitating. So there is a certain length where the gravity, potential energy due to gravity, is larger than the force, the gradients of pressure trying to keep the gas to do a sound wave. So the sound wave does not propagate anymore. But instead of propagating, it will start having bigger and bigger amplitude, then at some point it makes a, a, a cluster. So that's how you, you can start with a homogeneous medium with very small perturbations, like in the CMB, uh, delta T over T is of order 1 over 100,000 one part in 100,000, 10 to minus 5, and you end up with uh, clumps. Not yet galaxies, clumps, some clumps. Yeah. So uh, let's do this in a very simple way. Who knows Euler equations and things like that? I don't know. Only you. Okay. You too. <laughs> That's why you said thanks to each other. You know hydrodynamics, you don't mix with them. <laughs> now, okay, so it's very easy actually. This is a mass conservation equation. Local laboratory hydrodynamics, nothing very complicated here. Okay? Uh, no expansion to nothing. Okay? This tells you that the density, take a small box in coordinates that are fixed in space and time, take a small box containing many atoms or molecules or whatever. This is laboratory up to now. Atoms, laboratory, could be like matter also and things like that. Uh, and uh, the box contains many of these, but it's small compared to the size of the room, for example. So the this tells you that the change of density with time, partial derivative of density with time, in this box is simply the flux, the matter going in and out, the rho u, the moment the flux of the material, the mass flux of material, going in and out, okay? This is, this is a diversion, so this is a flux. And then there is a momentum conservation equation, the Euler equation. This, is, this means it's a perfect fluid, if you remember the energy momentum tensor. If you take the three by three part, this is diagonal, like in the FRW. The V is diagonal, the, the rho V squared, terms that were diagonal in energy momentum tensor in the spatial part, not of course the math part. Okay. So this is the pressure. Uh, so you only have for this is the Newtonian law, but there's two coordinates here, the coordinates of the fixed box and the coordinates of the fluid motion. 
So if you want to follow the fluid to write Newton's law, you do a total derivative. F equals ma in Newton's law, but a total derivative, a Lagrangian derivative is called also. Or sometimes in hydrodynamic, they call it a convective derivative. It's a total derivative following the motion of the particle. So you have one coordinate that is fixed, and another that is moving with the flow. So here is my uh, fluid particle containing many atoms, but small compared to the side. Here is my room, and here is my fluid part. And it moves like that. The Lagrangian derivative follows this. This. Well, this one is sitting here, the partial. So, right? So uh, once we've done that, we can write Newton's equation like this. Okay, and if there is gravity, there is the gravity force, which in the Newtonian limit is again our Poisson equation, Gauss law in differential form. Okay, so we got these three equations. Now we want to perturb the, 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 uh, these equations. This is a process that is quite important in mathematics and physics. It's called linearization. These are nonlinear equations, and they cannot be solved usually under normal circumstances, analytically, they're extremely complicated, yeah? other than a few special cases. You want to do a linearization. Well, what does it mean to do a linearization? Meaning, you've done it before, but you don't know. You've probably done it, actually, once per week in your courses. So uh, take a small perturbation around an average, OK? So we have two basic. Uh, Variables, rho and p, take small perturbations around their average. So there's delta rho over rho, and there is rho average, which is the rho downstairs. Okay, so we do that. Okay, and then we, 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 we replace this in these equations. And we subtract, we assume that these equations are only for the average, and we subtract them, use them to eliminate the average variables as much as possible. The ones on the bottom again. Okay? And, uh, and we ignore delta rho squared and so on because we say delta rho is over rho is less than 1. So, meaning that if delta, uh, our delta is 0 0.01, the delta squared is zero, 10 to the minus 4, which is 100 times less. Okay? So, we ignore quadratic, cubic, whatever, things that are bigger. And we end up with these two equations. OK, you can do this exercise. I'll give you all the slides. You can do it. It's not very difficult. You can do it. You can discuss it. And then we need an equation of state, similar to uh, equation of states in cosmology, but this is for non-relativistic fluid here. Because here, the pressures, what's important is nabla pressures, the pressure gradient in hydrodynamics, not the absolute value of the relativistic pressure like in the cosmology. Okay? This is different. So, equation of state, we define that the abatic sound speed does thus. The change in pressure is equal to the change of density times the speed squared. Why? Because we get, if we do this thing, we get a wave equation. This is called a wave equation. And, and wave equation, and now it's linear. What's so nice about linear equations is because you can solve them fairly easily. And solutions add up. If I have one solution, and a second solution, then one solution plus second solution is also solution. Actually, any linear combination. And you know that from quantum mechanics. So these are nice equations, relatively speaking. They create problems in quantum mechanics because you then have a superposition. They create conceptual problems because you have the Schrodinger cat <laughs> and, and things like that. But for us, they're very nice. So. This can be solved by Fourier analyzing mode, scary term. Well, Fourier analyzing just means that, uh, that we, we assume that the law is of this form. Why do we assume that? Because we find that we can get the, uh, a, a solution uh, for between delta rho and delta uh, and, and omega and t very easily. Uh, basically, with a linear dispersion. I've taken out the gravity here, by the way. This is without gravity, to simplify. Okay, so I've taken out the gravity. So you take, you, you get omega squared equals cs squared, a frequency uh, is proportional to wave number, 2 pi or lambda. Lambda is a wavelength, 2 pi or lambda is a wave number. 
So this is like a Fourier, what's called a Fourier mode. This is important for anything to do with the stuff we're talking about today and tomorrow, actually. Okay? So this is a Fourier mode. This thing is called a Fourier mode. And it has a frequency, and it has a wave number that are connected to a dispersion relation that you find by putting this and that. What does it mean? It means if I put this and that, I get a solution equal to zero. It ha ah, the equation is solved if this is true. This is very nice. And if you have boundary conditions, there are conditions on what if I don't, uh, on these things. If I don't have boundary conditions, then any omega and k are are okay. They, they will uh, they will be valid. Uh, if I have free boundary conditions, it might be. And uh, I can sum up all of that, and I get a, a total solution, a complete solution in terms of superposition of these things. Okay. Now, the thing with gravity, it adds up from the Poisson equation this term here. It means that my omega can become uh, imaginary. So this means that instead of having a wave, a sound speed, I have an exponential solution. Instead of, uh, this is in general important for all of linear mathematical physics, but an important here. I have k i k dot r solutions. Okay or omega, like this here. If, if, uh, if, this is, uh, uh, if this thing is real here, then I get things I are, or I t, I t, okay? Oscillatory, sines and cosine. If this is complex or imaginary, then I get e to the power of t, which blows up. Sine and cosine, general solution in terms of sines and cosine. So this tells you what? This tells you what we said. At some characteristic scale, called the genes length, defined by the k here and rho, there are two variables here, the, uh, uh, our solution blows up, meaning we get this instead of that. Okay? We get exponential blow up instead of, uh, tomorrow we'll see that in an expanded universe you get a power law blow up instead of exponential, but it's the same story. Uh, right, so if the pressure is small, gravity always clusters. This is quite an important thing. If the pressure is small, pressure gradients, formally speaking, are small, not the relativistic pressure, but also, of course, relativistic pressure. It's big, nothing clusters. That's why you will see that we we need dark matter. Okay. So the equilibrium is described by this thing that I uh, showed you in the first three. If there is time, the first slide in the first three, for the second. If there is time, I may try to show you how the zero theorem works, how you get it. You can get it from these other equations by taking moments over the position. So if it's thermal, this is Boltzmann constant that we we'll get to. This is, or if it's not thermal, simply it tells you that the potential energy is more or less of the same order, in fact twice, uh, the kinetic energy. This is kind of, and that's what holds a galaxy. And from there, we can get the gene's length again. The gene's length is the length that uh, a gas when I talk, we'll start making galaxies instead of you hearing me. This is your take-home message. Gene's length means I talk, I make a galaxy. <laughs> I make lots of galaxies. I don't make, uh, uh, I don't make sounds. Okay. So this uh, seems appealing to. Uh, so this is how structure forms. Then the universe cools. Uh, because it's expanding, and then you make structure, make galaxies and so on, and we're done. But that's not really how it is. People thought it could be like that, but it didn't work. I, I will try to explain why, and if, uh, and if there are questions, you can talk more. Huh? It's because of that, really, and its characteristics. This is the CMB that Alexei Nashev mentioned, and I mentioned in the beginning of the talk, and uh, cosmic microwave by run. And it was discovered in 1967 or something, and people got Nobel Prizes in 78. Jim Peebles only recently, even because he wasn't discovering, he was explaining the CMB. Uh, in a companion paper, 
This was discovered by engineers initially, and not like a nice black body spectrum like that. It was discovered as a certain antenna temperature, as what they call it. And, uh, and they were actually trying to do technologies. They worked for AT&T, or Bell Labs, Bell Labs. And they were trying to do technologies that became mobile phones nowadays. And they wanted to take out the noise, and they couldn't take out this noise even after they cleaned the Shulchak al Hamam. <laughs> the bird shit. <laughs> okay, they could. They did that. They actually went up and cleaned them. After they did that, and uh, Jim Peebles told them, who was nearby in New Jersey, told them this is the cosmic microwave background because Dickie was looking for it. And Jim Peebles knew that Dickie was, uh, was looking for it. This is the cosmic microwave background. He said, okay, so we'll write two papers. You write about your microwave background, we'll write about antenna temperature. <laughs> And they got the Nobel Prize, he did, but he got it now. Uh, and these guys uh, took it. Uh, the, uh, the name, the problem. Anyway, they took it in 2006. OK? Uh, right. This is a perfect black body radiation. And these, this is Kopi that discovered the Planck spectrum. Now, there was a lot of controversy whether this is really thermal equilibrium or not before Kopi. They didn't know if it's really black body or not because of the uh, observations from the Earth were not very good. And there was lots of people writing papers why it's not black body. Well, it turned out to be black body. Okay. Uh, and the most perfect black body that you could ever get. You can't get that from experiments on Earth. Uh, this is really perfect black body. Uh, at least relative to what you can do in the laboratory. Huh? And uh, Kobe discovered the black body and discovered the fluctuations, but only at a very rough scale. WMAP did much better, and Planck is where we get our pictures from that I show you all the time. So what is a black body radiation? We have, uh, it follows Stefan's law. Stefan? Stefan Boltz? Uh, Stefan or Stefan Boltz? I forgot. Anyway, Stefan's law. Tito the four. <laughs> Follows T4, and this is its energy density, which is about 2.6 times 10 to 5 electron volt. For this is in joules per meter cube. This is electron volt per meter cube, and this is its temperature electron volt. You immediately see that if I have H nu is roughly kT because of this exponential in a Planck distribution, then I have 10 to the 9 photons per meter cube, and the number of protons per meter cube in the universe is about one. So this is like 10 to the 9 times. Okay, you can immediately see it from measuring the energy density and measuring the temperature. That there are 10 to the 9 photons per meter cube. Then the distribution is this, which is the uh, Planck spectrum. Now, this is the number of uh, frequencies, oscillators, per unit frequency. So if you integrated it, omega, it's a new Q which is simply the volume in frequency space. Like the volume in now uh, normal space is, is uh, x cubed or a cubed, the uh, scale factor and so on, that we were discussing. This is on a uh, new cube. And before Planck, people uh, thought this is really strange because this gives you what they used to call a uh, really genius catastrophe. But Planck thought that these guys uh, have a Boltzmann factor. Their distribution depends on energy. Okay, they are oscillators that are not; uh, they cannot have arbitrary uh, frequencies, and we just count them, which gives you a new cube. No, they depend also on frequency, their energy, and if their energy depends on frequency in equilibrium, we have a Boltzmann factor. So it's suppressed by this Boltzmann factor, and then we get this. And this has a definite temperature. So that's how we know the temperature of the CMB. Because you can uh, uh, parameterize the curves for different temperatures. And we fit this, turns out to be uh, 2.7 whatever Kelvin. Okay. Very precisely, of course, we know. Right? So, okay, so what is equilibrium? Uh, just to, uh, uh, for those who want a reminder, uh, this is like a bolts on the spoon in Vienna. You get that, uh, that he thought that uh, the entropy is uh, proportional to uh, the logarithm of the number of possible states. 
and the number of possible states is maximum, I think, uh, the number of possible states classically is the number of possible momenta and, uh, and uh, coordinates, PQ, and that is maximized, the volume is then maximized. In quantum mechanics, it's the number of possible states and your are Okay? Semi classically, you do uh, HQ. Bar, or the other bar. Anyway, let's suppose our uh, omega is made up of probabilities which are proportional to your volume. Let's say we are classical now, and we make probability, or semi classical, and probabilities that are both, and the probabilities are independent. So the probability that you get one head in one point course is half, toss in half. You get two heads in two twin courses of a quarter, one over eight, and so on. So you multiply them together, independent probability. And so you transform this into that by substituting this. And then you want to equate this to zero, to maximize, to extremize if Boltzmann is correct. Under the condition that the total probability is one, okay, that's normalization condition. Uh, that gives you this condition, obviously, and uh, because uh, d1 is zero, and uh, that the total energy remains of the system remains constant. So this is equivalent. Uh, I have many devices. If there is no constraint, the probability of getting one third or uh, three or one or two is all one over six because there are six different states. Six. But if I constrained that I have to do it in such a way, I keep on trying in such a way, the total of all dices, of all the labels, remains like, let's say, 100, and I fix it, I constrain it on that, then it's not like that. Then you uh, uh, basically, uh, doing the, uh, the, the differential here and noting that this is zero, so this one goes, and putting uh, and trying to, to maximize this. Uh, get this to zero. Under these constraints, you get that. You can do it also in terms of Lagrange multiplier. Okay, but well, this is this is the distribution that will uh, maximize your entropy under the condition that this total energy is zero as uh, as constant. You can do on the other conditions. You have other Lagrange multiplier. Momentum, say you want to conserve angular momentum, whatever. Okay, but this is the same thing you you meet in uh, textbooks. Okay. And you meet it in this form with a, with a partition function, which is the normalization here, and a Boltzmann factor. And if you compare it, you do a little change in energy, and you compare it with the, uh, with the reversible uh, law of thermodynamics, the reversible entropy change when you change heat, you'll find that this beta is 1 over kT. So Boltzmann put something that he didn't know what it is, in the beginning, just a normal, uh, like a proportionality factor, and then he compared with this thermodynamic relation and uh, found that it is uh, a temperature, uh, one over uh, k. Uh, uh, it, the constant is relate. The constant relates this uh, maximization thing here, uh, another this uh, constant that is an exponential to a temperature. So it's a bit like what we discussed on Thursday, where you, uh, uh, where uh, we didn't know how to do a of a of t from observation, and then went and calibrated. He also had a statistical theory. He calibrated this with a thermodynamic relation to find that this uh, constant is really what uh, is uh, is really uh, this related to beta, which is this, and this is the energy. And this is the Boltzmann factor. So when Planck decided that the oscillators depend on energy, he had to get a Boltzmann factor. Okay? Before there was no Boltzmann factor. That the oscillator, sorry, not the oscillators depend on energy. The oscillators energy, uh, the oscillators have energy that depends on frequency. It's not independent on frequency. So therefore, you get uh, a Boltzmann factor on your distribution. Okay? Right? So, a very, very rough estimate, but actually turns out to be uh, quite close to the correct value, sometimes you're lucky, of the time uh, of recombination of the cosmic microwave. What does it mean, recombination? It means that 
the temperature, when roughly speaking, it's not like a delta function. It's, uh, it's not completely localized in time, but let's say it is. But when suddenly, the suddenly in our approximation, uh, the, the hydrogen is uh, recombined. Basically, the plasma turns into atoms because the energy is low. So the, uh, so the electrons stick to the protons and they make hydrogen atoms. Okay? Before that, we see perfect equilibrium. So there was some sort of thermal As I said, you can't produce this blood body at home or in your best labs. Okay? So there was quite something close to a thermal Very, very close. So, and then you decouple. Okay? The radiation now comes to us as we see it in the sky. Okay? It come, when does it come to us? When did it leave? The, the electrons and protons alone so that they can go and make galaxies and stars and people and so on. When did it leave? They left it when, I mean, we don't know yet, okay, but we will say it has to be related to the ionizing temperature or ionizing energy of, uh, ionizing energy of uh, hydrogen, which is 13.6 EV. You give uh, hydrogen you put hydrogen at, a, at, a, at an energy, 13.6 EV, uh, it, uh, the electron leaves the proton. Okay? So, uh, so, we're, so if we take this directly, the energy, so we want to know how many ionizing photons there are. An ionizing photon in a thermal bath is one that has enough energy to kick the electron out of the proton. And, and make the hydrogen ion up. So how many of these are there? Right, so if these are suppressed by a Boltzmann factor because they have a Boltzmann, well, they have a plant distribution which has a Boltzmann factor. Okay? So they are subdued. So at energies, if I, my temperature is much larger than, I'm writing it here in dimensions, but you can also put K here in temperature in Kelvin, or you put EV and temperature in an EV. <laughs> and in that case, it's easier uh, to compare for our purposes here. Okay, so this is subdued exponentially for temperature beyond 13 EV. And the energy of a photon is, uh, is uh, 3T, more or less, it's 2.8 or something in the, in the cosmic microwave band and in the Planck spectrum, like body. And so you get T equals uh, 4.5. That is, the cosmic microwave background will come from T 4.5 EV. Actually, it's not really T 4.5 EV. It is uh, because there are 10 to the 9 photons per uh, value, per electron and proton. Uh, so therefore, we must multiply this 10 to the 9 times this subduing factor. And then you get 0.2 EV. A good calculation gives you 0.3, so it's not bad at all. Okay? And that corresponds to about 3,000 Kelvin. This is not very hot, so therefore you know the physics. This is like only a few times hotter than your uh, household oven. Your household oven is like 5, 500 degrees Kelvin, or maybe a bit more, 700 or something. So this is uh, 500 centigrade. So so 700, 800 Kelvin. So, so this is only a few times uh, in the gas and dark of the big hand report. So, so therefore, you know the physics, which makes it really nice. Uh, easy. And then uh, you find uh, the temperature at your combination. Well, there is a one here. Uh, this is inconsistent. Is, uh, uh, this temperature of 3,000 is about 1,000 times 100 or 1,000 times the temperature today. We measure the CMB today, it's 2.7, and this is 3,000, so there's a factor of 1,000, right? So the scale factor, which goes as temperature, because the redshifting goes as energy of the photon, that goes as temperature. So uh, meaning that, the, that the, uh, the scale factor of the universe was a thousand times uh, smaller at recombination than it is today. 
right? The universe, the, the things were farther time closer at the time of the recombination, the time you see this picture coming from, than it is today. Uh, and if you do just the, the Einstein Resitra universe flat, uh, zero curvature, matter dominated from then to here, and it's a very good approximation, and you, because the dark energy is only redshift 0 0.7 or something, or one, maximum. So before that, it was all matter dominated, really. Okay? Before that, between us and the CMB, for all practical purposes, for this kind of order of magnitude, it's uh, not all practical purposes, for all order of magnitude heuristic purposes, uh, this is, uh, uh, this is uh, uh, valid. The scale factor varies as a power law t to two over three, which you heard earlier today in time. Okay, so that means if you put this 14 giga years, so about 400,000 years after the beginning of the time. So we know the time also of this thing. So I need to move on. So the fluctuations C and B are small. You can treat them in the linear regime, which makes things very easy. Uh, relatively speaking, because they're very small, they're 10 to the minus 5. So 10 to the minus 5 squared is 10 to the minus 10. So the delta squared and so on are very small. Okay, so you can do a linear regime. It involves quite complex kinetics involving coupled photon field to varying fluid and so on, but it's well understood. This is as opposed to galaxy formation, which those who like uh, neat things really don't like. I mean, there are particle physics who like the CMB to some extent, but galaxy formation is a challenge for people who are like we were saying, it's more like ecology than from the best of things. This is between, <laughs> but it's very well understood. So one thing is that is quite well understood is uh, the fluctuations in the CMB. And um, now I put this in an appendix, extra information that you can look at, but you can get a, now, because this thing is, uh, is tightly coupled, the photons are tightly coupled to the electrons, and, 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 and the photons are coupled to the both, to the electrons, this thing is quite tightly coupled to something with the speed of light, which are the photons, and therefore they have a speed of sound, which is 1 over square root 3 of the photons. Light has pressure for uh, energy density. Okay, and if you uh, uh, and therefore has a sound speed that is one over square root of three, the speed of one. Okay, and because it has rho proportional to t four and a number density as proportional to t cubed, you can make a uh, uh, an equation for light for the flow of the fluid flow of light and a continuity equation for the conservation. Uh, of number density and so on. And you get that wave equation for the temperature fluctuations here. It is in the, in the appendix. Uh, it's not difficult, by the way. You just follow more or less the same steps uh, that you do for, uh, for, uh, for a fluid, for a normal fluid with your, equa your equational state P in third row instead of uh, the equations of states that uh, we put. So this automatically gives you the sound speed because this is c squared, okay? This is c squared. This is the c squared, the delta p and delta rho is a third, okay? We said this is c squared, delta p equals c squared delta rho. So automatically you find uh, that it's square root of 3c. I put 3c equals 1. So square root of 3c, okay? The sound speed, okay? 1 over a square root of 3c. Yeah. So if we put c here, right? So that's uh, sound speed. Uh, you get this wave equation, which is like the wave equation uh, we did before, but we already Fourier transformed it in the wave number direction. So this is like the wave equation. Here's our wave equation from before. We put here, uh, we already divide them to modes, but we do not uh, do the time, we only do the space. Why don't we do the time? Because we see a snapshot at recombination. We don't see the evolution of the temperature wave in the cosmic microwave background. So what are these? Theta is delta t over t, the relative temperature changes on this map that we see. 
on the cosmic microwave background. So this is the map of the cosmic microwave background. This is, we count T here and T average, and, and doing the delta T over T everywhere. And we do an equation for that. We take out the expansion here by doing conformal time, okay? And, uh, our friend here where I take out the CO. Or the co-moving distance we did last time. Okay? So you put it here and you Fourier transform in space, meaning I say rho proportional to some rho k e to the power of i k i. Okay? Right? You differentiate e to the power of i k r twice, you get a k squared, right? Is that clear? You do IKR here, K squared times IKR and zero. The IKR is gold. Okay? But we don't have to have to finish. So, okay. So, theta now not plus uh, minus minus C squared, number squared. differentiate twice, so this thing goes down twice. Once k and twice k. And there's an i square which makes this positive. Okay, so you get this uh, Okay, once you get this thing here, uh, then you, uh, for adiabatic solutions, meaning the initial perturbations that we are assuming, that I'll speak a bit about, and maybe I'll say this before, are are volume compressions. They affect all particles the same, and they are compressions in the volume. That's why you're using. Uh, and that means because of the different relations between the expansion rate, uh, ex uh, the equation of state of the, of the raw matter and raw uh, uh, photons, uh, you get this relation between the two. Uh, because uh, rho uh, matter goes as AQ, 1 over A cubed, the density, and rho uh, photons or uh, radiation goes one over eight to the four. So you get a third year and a fourth year. Okay. Um, and if they're adiabatic, then your initial theta is small, theta dot. Your initial conditions for your harmonic oscillator here, theta dot is small. Because, you know, you just compress the volume from zero uh, theta dot. And so this is your solution of the harmonic oscillator. This in terms of conformal time to take out the expansion, and this is the sound speed, and this is the wave number 2 pi over lambda wave. Okay? And this is the speed. That's where it should go. 1 over 3rd C square root of the equation of state. And this is because we did hydrodynamics with an equation of state like this one, and total energy density like this one, and number density like this one. Like I said, I have extra material in the slides that you can follow. To, to do this in detail. The most important thing for us here is uh, you want to connect it to observations. How do I connect this stuff to observations? It seems like in the beginning, wow, am I going to really connect this to something I see and get numbers out of it? Yes, you do. So first of all, we said this thing is frozen at recombination a good approximation. It's frozen at a certain time that we really take like 380,000 years after the beginning of the expansion. So that's the picture I see. Now, I want to convert it to things I know about. So how do I do this? First of all, this is uh, a wave equation solution, a harmonic oscillator. And this is what's called the sound horizon of recombination, meaning we had the light horizon last time. This is the sound horizon. How fast 
not how much does the sound of a photon wave, we're ignoring everything else out for simplicity, uh, of a photon wave, a wave in a photon fluid, with the equation of say P equal third row, which makes it a fluid, right? Uh, a wave in a photon fluid, how much does it travel in the time between t equals zero, so to speak, and uh, t equals the combination 400,000 years, or 380, 70, or whatever, okay? So this is it, and we approximate it by just the square root of three. This is variable in principle, but it doesn't vary that much because most of the time, since c equals zero to 400,000 years, is dominated by radiation, actually. So you can say there's just a square root of, third, square root of three c. Okay, so, uh, and they are frozen at this particular point, which would have peaks at Pi k sound horizon equals n pi. That's what the sines and cosines are, are like, you know? They're periodic in 2 pi, so you have the maximum, what, half a, uh, half a uh, revolution at pi, and another one at 2 pi, and so on. It's a sine or a cosine, okay? So it has peaks at k s star equals n pi. So, and these are here. How do I get these peaks? How do I relate this? We got our wave number now. If we know this, which we think we know from here, and we know n pi, of course, we just 1 pi, 2 pi, 3 pi, and so therefore we know k of the peaks. How do we turn it into, we don't observe k of the peaks. What do you observe? You observe angles on the sky, really. So you, uh, you do, you, uh, you, uh, you analyze your picture of the sky, your, 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 your mess here. You analyze it into spherical harmonics so that you can analyze this, these uh, incoherent waves, you see. We want to analyze them into angles to find our peaks, our resonances here. Okay? So we want to analyze them into angles to see our resonance. So, okay, so they are, so we analyze them. They are at one degree and a little, uh, uh, and a little less and so on. And before that, there are no peaks. So this is pi 1, n1, n2, n3, and so on. This is a square, okay? So that this is first compression. So this is a wave that has gone to one compression, a sound wave. It has gone to one compression at recombination. You're seeing the wavelength that has gone to one compression. Shorter wavelength will go through many compressions. Longer wavelength here will not go through any compressions. And this is the first road. This is the first rarefaction. And this is the second compression, rarefaction, and so on. From the circle harmonics. You, you do circular harmonics and you connect it to angles. You connect this thing to angles. Now, how do you connect this thing to angles? Now, this is how do we connect the observations to angles fairly straightforward from, from circular harmonics. Because this is like Fourier analysis, is a, which is this, is a, this is a good question in principle. Uh, the Fourier analysis is an analysis in translation in variant waves. Okay? in wavelength. Circular harmonics is a Fourier analysis in angles. So we convert. And we convert it now and we get something really interesting with the distance you see here. Through the Naoyi. Here's the equation of the Naoyi model. Angular diameter this, yes. No, no, it's number density. It's number densities. No, it doesn't. You can have you know, number densities increasing and decreasing. And you can have mean motion also, apparent. Yes, yeah, distribution. It's not normal. So not. 
then being redshifted, which is an important event. But being redshifted will change the standard. And I'll speak about sorry. How do you exactly does that? What's the mechanism that actually changes the best? Oh well, well there's a potential, but I didn't we're assuming there is a mechanism that that's because I'm out of time. Let's get to the mechanism. We'll get it to it tomorrow and maybe I'll see get to it. Let's assume for the top meeting there is. There's a potential. I, it, I, I took it out here. I want to do this really simple. But I'll bring it back, by the way, in a, if I have time in a couple of slides. Okay. okay? There is a potential. There's gravity, which does a lot of things. It changes the energy density. It, cha it redshifts the photons also. Something called that good. It there's a, there's a frequency. Okay. But yeah, that's a good question because it's actually, uh, this is only one mechanism, but it is the dominant for the first peak. So we can get our universe distance. You and I can trick you and get you the right numbers. It's a dominant one for the first peak, but there's a huge amount of stuff. Okay? There's a lot of things. Okay? But, but for the purpose, okay, I'll take a few minutes more. I guess I, 10 minutes. I <laughs> Uh, just to, because otherwise they will get, I don't want to speak about the CMB again. <laughs> At least not in any, because they'll forget by tomorrow, you know. Uh, uh, so here is our wave. This is the first peak in here, a pi. Two pi is down here, okay? This is from Wayne Hill pages again. I really suggest you look at Wayne Hill's pages. Okay, so and he's got nice animations and things. But some of them I'm showing here. Okay, so this is pi, there will be two pi. So let's take the pi. And our p first of all, there's a distance to the angular diameter distance uh, that is defined for anything of radius d. Remember last time in Maulin? Remember this? Okay, so this is an angular diameter of this. So, we think we know theta from the observations, from the circular harmonics of the first peak, and we know it from other peaks, but let's first get to the first peak. And we think we know d from the sound horizon to recombination. The distance sound can travel at a speed that we are approximate by 1 over square root 3 of the speed of light in the time between the beginning, doesn't matter which beginning exactly, but yeah, very small time, to uh, recombination 400,000 years. Okay? And then we do our condition, but in wavelength, this time. K is 2 pi over lambda. So K theta will equal, will equal n pi equals, K, I'm sorry, K uh, uh, sound horizon would equal uh, n pi. And this is 2 pi over lambda. And at half peak is uh, over 2, because it's, it's half mode. It's half mode. First peak is at half mode. First compression of the CMB. Of the photon gas. First compression. So we get this relation between our FRW coordinate R of last time FRW coordinate r that define the angular diameter distance and the, the sound horizon, which is square root 3, 1 over square root 3 of the light horizon, and, uh, and, uh, and theta that we see from observation. From this, you can get a lot of information about the universe. This on its own. For example, Let's try a flat universe, meaning that r will be just the co-moving distance, tau. r is equal to the conformal time. Uh, well, it's equal to the co-moving distance, but the co-moving distance between 0 and tau star, uh, meaning the recombination, is much smaller than between us and the recombination because we are 14 giga years later, and this is only 400,000 years. So we can ignore the tau star, and the co-moving distance will be the conformal time. Okay? So the conformal time, as I told you, is really a distance. Okay? So, uh, so that you can calculate. Anyway, we put it on our equation here, 
and we get a ratio between tau star and tau naught, meaning the conformal time at recombination, the conformal time now. Uh, and we know, from uh, if we assume matter domination, that A is proportional to T over 2, T over 3. And it's the same for radiation, by the way. Uh, no, no, this is not the same, but this is the same. So the, we know the variation of the scale factor with conformal time. It goes to like A to the half, or the conformal time scale factor. So if we know from the slide of before that the, the redshift ratio A equal 1 today and A equals uh, 1 over 1,000 or 1,100, we got that, remember, from the ionization of the, of the hydrogen from our order of magnitude calculation. So we know the redshift you'll find that uh, theta put in these numbers, you'll find theta to be one degree. What does this tell you? It tells you that the universe is nearly flat. Because we tried a flat universe, we tried a relation between the, between the FRW uh, uh, radius or radial coordinate and the co-moving distance, which is just equal because it's flat. And uh, uh, so our theta was just a ratio of a conformal time at recombination and conformal time now. And we just put the equation that I gave you last week and I say gave you today and so on, a proportional to 2 t over 3. And we know from last slide that this is 1 over 1,000, the ratio of, uh, of scale factor. It's 1,000 times. So therefore, we can get the ratio of that is square root of that. Put it in here and convert. Uh, degrees into radians and all the stuff, or radians into degrees, you get uh, for n equals 1 the peak correct. So what we know from that already is that we live in a flat universe to a good approximation. If we didn't live in a flat universe, these things would move like that. Things at the same co-moving distance would look further, because r is not simply dc. It's not a co-moving distance anymore. It's a sine function. So things uh, look closer for the same uh, co-moving distance. They will appear closer on the Euclidean projection that is R. Okay? It will be the reverse if we have a shine, a negative hyperbolic space. They look further away. Right? So these peaks will start moving. Okay? These things will start moving. So from where they move, I found it at one degree. In an open universe, it goes like that. So I can know the curve of our universe by measuring these distances, by calculating these distances and measuring theta. Okay? And this thing is a bit more complicated here. It's called the Sachsworth, integrated Sachsworth effect, but ask me if you are interested. Uh, same with lambda, but a bit more weakly. Because things in the universe with a cosmological constant recently would be stretched much more, so it would look further away. Okay? Same with lambda. Lambda is far more important nowadays than, <laughs> than the curve. Uh, but as I said, there is a degeneracy, so that's why you could have different lambda and different omega and so on. If you look at the CMB alone, you can do combinations and they may still work. Okay? So uh, the CMB alone does not tell you for a fact that lambda how much it and especially if it's an analyzed back then. Okay. But you know, with the supernova of last time and the large scale structure of tomorrow, we can get very good constant. Okay. Now the last couple of quick things I want to mention in this thing. I cheated and I put uh, the inertia zero, but the inertia is not zero really. Of the photon gas, there is an inertia. And the variance, if you load it, it will have more inertia. It's small, but it's important to check how many variants I have. Because this thing has variants. Right? And dark matter is not sitting alone. You know? I did it sitting alone because the first peak, like I said, is fairly independent. The location, not the height. The height is quite complicated. But in terms of the location is fairly independent of, of, the, of the first peak. So really, it's a harmonic oscillator with a mass. If I put more baryons, they participate with the photons and they make more inertia in oscillation. Because when, they, when you compress it and there is a loading with extra material, uh, 
uh, that doesn't have pressure really. Uh, it, it is uh, 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 the, the, the peaks become uh, larger, especially the second peak. Uh, why? Because the second peak is to do with the rarefaction. So the, ba the, the thing is loaded with the barrels and it will, it will decompress more, uh, more difficult to decompress because it's loaded with the barrels. The, the, the thing, the spring is down. So the decompression is less. So you see it in the second peak, especially. First peak also, but especially the second peak of the barrels. Okay? So, 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 because it's loaded with extra inertia, extra mass. So, and the barriers don't contribute to pressure, so the sound speed changes too. It's adiabatic fluctuations, that we, by the way, they're not the only fluctuations, but, they, but, but there's others, like the curvature, the, the, the far quantities, adiabatic are more than enough because they explain the data fairly well. That's all. Okay? So, meaning volume compression, you do your volume compression, remember? In the very beginning with the Euler equation, delta P C equals C squared delta rho. So you do it, and the volumes of the, of the baryons change with scale factor. The energy density of the baryons changes with scale factor differently than from the radiation. One goes as 1 over A cubed, the other 1 over A to the 4 because of the red shifting. And therefore, your, the sound speed of the coupled fluid and also the, the, the pressure is only due to the, the relativistic pressure is only due to the to the photons, not due to the baryons, the electrons or the protons. Well, electrons or baryons for our purposes. That's astrophysicists do this kind of thing. Uh, and so you get uh, a sound speed that is smaller by a factor of r horizontal. Three over four. You can see how this comes about. A to the four and EQ. If you don't believe me, just do this exercise here. And you do it yourself. I think these things you should do it yourself because otherwise, uh, you know, I just can't say anything about it. <laughs> okay, so this is barrier loading. This is, so we measure how much barium there are like that. And it turns out to be quite close to, or uh, almost coincident, with the barriers you find in the Big Bang Nuclear Center that uh, Hoyle, Taylor, and before them, Alpha and Gamma, but so on that uh, way. Alpha, Beta, and Gamma. So. OK, there's something called radiation driving. This is the last thing. I'll try to work. I'll be brief about it. Now, there are potential wells uh, driving all okay? this. The potential wells that come from some, but we think they come from fractal quantum uh, fluctuations in a scalar field coupled to the metric. Right? So, the, and the metric has potential. Okay? So you have potential fluctuations. Okay, so uh, now, if there were baryons and photons alone, these potentials would decay with the expansion. Because you're expanding, the, the potential level would decay. Dark matter, because it, it, because it doesn't have pressure, keeps the potential from the thing. So if you didn't have dark matter, uh, the potential would decay. And in their decay, there was a sort of, I'm a tall cowboy, I'm a big cowboy, and there's a sort of uh, swing effect when, when the cowboy uh, increases the length of his, uh, of his uh, well, nowadays you should say the cowboy or cowgirl increases the length of hair. <laughs> okay. uh, so there is this effect. This is called uh, radiation driving. Again, the pages by me and you are very useful. Okay. So and it ha it keeps on going at least to, uh, to uh, equality between ra radiation and and matter. A equality. We said before that radiation was dominant in the beginning. It was a to the four. And then matter, because it decays only as a cube becomes dominant and so on. So there's an A quality. Now this changes. Dark matter changes the height of these peaks, especially the height of the third peak. Because it keeps it from dissolving. And, and, and all 
uh, and all the fluctuations or all the waves going into the first peak, basically the first compression. The second compression, which is the third peak, will be small. Second compression, third peak will be small because the, the potentials are gone. <laughs> they're, they're inflated away. Not inflated as inflation, but they're expanded away. Okay, so the third peak will be small if you don't have the dark matter that doesn't participate, doesn't interact with the photons. Okay? So this is a very important test of dark matter independent of the rotation curves of galaxies. That we take. And modified gravity theories that they try to, 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 to modify gravity instead of, uh, uh, of having dark matter, modifying gravity, Newtonian and Einstein laws of gravity, they have a problem producing this third peak, usually. Not easy to produce them if you don't have that map, because the potentials just die. And then there is something called the single silk damping beyond that, diffusion damping. To a vanity approximation, or a very colloquial approximation, it is similar to why when there is a party far away, you hear the, the long waves, you don't hear the small waves. The small waves things can diffuse away from them very easily. But, but because in our approximation, we said a volume that contains many particles to do an oil, perfect fluid Euler equation with a diagonal stress tensor, it means the particles are not escaping much from shearing with the, with the, with the in, uh, not escaping much this volume diffusing away from it to a, into a neighbor of volume. Now this is, as the volume gets lower, this gets more difficult. That's first of all. Second of all, uh, uh, they've done too many oscillations. But most important of all is that recombination, because things are recombining. The, the mean free path of the photons becomes quite large. And so they diffuse out of these volumes of the last 70 uh, uh, ratchet, so to speak, from Z. Uh, uh, a recombination to Z last scattering, you know, like a, it's a 70 out of the thousand. Okay? And this last thing they diffuse, and this does the, so the so the sound waves and so sound, etc. We hear the big uh, party here. Okay, so this is very similar. Amplified by the fact that at recombination, this effect is really uh, big because of the mean free path. So that's how you uh, can fix your parameters from the CMB. Uh, curvature makes it go like that and also like that for the soft food. Uh, dark energy uh, makes it also go uh, a little bit like that and also a bit like that. So and this is a big test for dark energy models in these tails here, because these tails are different for, for uh, uh, cosmological constant and, and, and things, you know, because they come from variable potential. They come from the, from the threat shifting of photons. It's absolutely the, the, the basic effects here are the threat shifting, the number density, and there's also Doppler shifting, because there's speeds, different speeds for the photons. So there's Doppler shifting. So Doppler shifting, gravitational red shifting, and, uh, and, uh, and number density changes. And the integrated uh, shifting, this mainly comes from what the photons did going through the universe. <laughs> so these tails are the, what the photons did, red shifting, going through the universe, the integrated such world. This is what they did on their way. They changed the red shift of their, their frequencies. Okay. So these are important for models, for example, where the dark energy changes different from the lambda CDM, uh, and therefore the threat shifting is changing. Okay, okay. dark energy does uh, this, and this is curvature, it does the same, more or less, like dark energy or even more. Variance increase uh, the peaks, especially the third peak, uh, and dark matter increases the third peak and decreases the other peaks. So, uh, uh, and, and, from fitting, and from fitting this to data, you get the lambda CDM. Almost perfectly. For omega, uh, 
for for 70% cosmological constant, 24% black matter, 5% normal matter, and uh, and an H slow Hubble constant that is about 67, 68 kilometers per second per megaparsec. This is a bit different from that you get from local uh, measurements that we discussed last time with the supernova, which is 73 or something, 74. And this is a big thing now that's called the Hubble tension. So people think there's something there. If it's not due to measurements in the, or, or something uh, to do with the supernova distances, then it's probably something very important. So uh, uh, beyond the CMB, I'm almost done. Well, I'm done. Uh, they uh, then the uh, after the CMB, uh, the variants uh, can start to collapse. The electrons and protons, <coughs> the hydrogen atoms and helium and so on, can start because it's not coupled anymore to the photon field. So it can start to make galaxies. And luckily, they find in Nanda CDM already dark matter having done the potential wells for them, or at least significantly, because it wasn't coupled to the sound waves. It was already collapsing. We'll discuss this tomorrow. OK? So you need dark matter for that. You need it for the peaks. And you need it also because of the silk damping, the diffusion damping, uh, the, the perturbations. In the photon fluid, the photon barrier will be damped. They are damped on all scales beyond. They are damped on all scales here. And these scales, and these scales are, and these scales are like 10 megaparsecs. They're much larger than galaxies, which start at one kiloparsec. So, so it, the perturbations are gone. In the dark matter, they are not gone. So if you didn't have dark matter, you cannot also form galaxies at all. You have to form bigger things, or they used to call them Zandovich pancakes, you know, of the order of bigger than cluster sizes, and then smaller ones. This is not how we think things form. We think they form smaller and bigger, and I'll get to that later. All right, so that's it, really. So uh, we will need dark matter. I'll talk about that tomorrow. Sorry for being a bit uh, too long. Uh, okay. Any questions?